All right. Good morning. How's everyone doing today? Good. Thank you. Good. Okay, so uh, today we'll talk a bit about Arc Swift, and uh, the purpose of this lecture is to give you everything you'll need to uh, start creating reactive apps on your own when you come back home today. Um, so I'll start off quickly telling about myself. Um, my name is Shai, I come from Israel. Um, currently uh, work on, uh, on the Kimmel app, which is a coffee brand in Canada and the US. Do a lot of course work for uh, Arc Swift and the uh, Arc Swift community. Fonz, as mentioned before. And uh, I'm also a tech editor and author for raywenderlake.com. So quickly, go over. Oh, seems like this microphone isn't working that well. Any better? Good. OK, so let's quickly go over uh, what we're going to learn today. Uh, I don't know, uh, maybe we'll switch to the regular mic. Yep. <laughs> Here we go. Sorry about that. Okay, so uh, we will ner learn about what is really basically Rx and why would you even want to use it in your apps. We'll go over some of the building blocks for reactive application and Rx in general. Uh, we'll talk about Rx Coco, which is Rx Swift's uh, UI companion, everything related to connecting streams with your uh, app's UI. Uh, we'll talk about some myths, as the name of the talk is debunking some myths about Rx and Rx Swift. Uh, and I'll give you some uh, resources on where you can go next to learn more about Rx uh, in your learning journey. And of course, I'll have an abundant amount of me uh, memes across this entire lecture because that's just what I do. So uh, let's start with the first thing. Uh, what is Rx? So uh, we'll start with the dictionary definition of this, which is an API for asynchronous programming with observable streams. That's the definition by ReactiveX. And I guess you're reading that and thinking to yourself, an API for a what now exactly? It's a bit confusing, but I hope that by the time uh, we end this lecture, it's going to be very obvious for you. So you need to start uh, by understanding something called the observer pattern. And in that observer pattern, it's a design pattern that says we have one object called an observable, and we have a list of objects observing it called observers. And every time the observable changes its value, it will let all of these other subscribers know that a change has occurred. So for example, if I have an observable of is ready, I can have a bunch of subscribers to it that are observing its current value. It can be a view or some manager class or anything really. And whenever that is ready changes, all of these subscribers are going to automatically be notified of that change. So uh, a checklist of what is Rx and what is not really. So it is about focusing on data flow of your app and defining behavior to drive your app. Instead of more imperatively uh, writing line by line what to do, you would just have pieces of data that tells your app how to behave. Uh, it is a new concept to most developers because we weren't taught really how to build iOS apps in this way. We were taught to use the UI kit uh, APIs and Apple APIs. Uh, and it is a bit uh, mind bending for some uh, developers. There is a bit of a high learning curve. Um, the goal of this lecture isn't to make you an expert, uh, per se, but it is to get you started in that world and kind of show you that it's not as hard as you might think. Uh, as I said, we'll probably kind of bend your brain until one day you're writing code and it will just click and it would make much more sense to you. Be patient. Like any new technology that is new that you haven't worked with before and isn't trivial, it's going to take some experimentation and just working with it to get the hang of it. Why would you even want to use Rx? So a couple of reasons. First of all, it provides a unified API uh, when dealing with asynchronous APIs in general and synchronous actions. It's just a way to model all sorts of asynchrony under one, uh, one pattern. It provides a mechanism to reactively handle and manipulate values over time, like I mentioned earlier, because of that observable pattern you can react to every change that happens in your app and do things with those changes. Um, um, so as I mentioned earlier, unless you focus on writing the declarative and expected code, and that means that you have data driving your app instead of actions that you just write. A uh, change of data is what would cause, for example, a table view to reload. Instead of calling reload data, you would have a piece of that data that whenever it changes, the fact that it changed would cause your UI to update. And finally, it encourages good architecture because when working with streams, it will be very hard to write like very poor architecture because of the way the streams are structured. 
Also, it is a multi-platform concept. So um, ReactiveX, which I mentioned earlier, is this roof organization that maintains the ReactiveX standard and the RX standard in general. And uh, it is the same across all platforms. So you can, once you learn RX Swift, you know most of the basic concepts in RX Java and RX Kotlin and Dart and Go and every other version of RX. There are some minor differences between the different implementations, but mostly they are minor. Uh, most of the knowledge you gain is platform agnostic, which is very powerful. Uh, because, for example, in our company, we do uh, Rx Java for Android and Rx Swift for iOS. And our companies that also do Rx on the back end, so they can communicate between them and have uh, you know, a peer communication about streams and how they build the logic of, of their app. Um, some of the companies using Rx. So Rx is very mature at this point. A lot of really big companies are using it. Uh, we're using, as I mentioned, Uber are very heavily invested in using Rx on both iOS and Android. Airbnb, Netflix are a big uh, uh, maintainer of Rx Java, for example. Um, so again, very, very big uh, household names are using uh, that technology today on both iOS, Android, and backend. So um, let's kind of talk about the concept of reactive, what reactive means. So here's some basic Swift, regular Swift code. And I have a user's balance, um, and there is this product price. The, pro the pro uh, product costs $10, and I only have $5, so I can't buy that product. That's going to be false. Um, later on, that user gets some more money. They now have $25, uh, and the product costs 10 or euros for that matter. And uh, now this value, it's still false. Even though I have enough money to buy that product now, that can make purchase doesn't reflect, reflect the latest state of my system. Uh, a reactive Rx code would look more similar to this. And you don't have to understand it too much, but it's pretty basic. Um, you combine the latest value or the balance and the product, and you map that to a Boolean saying, is this greater than that? Uh, and this thing is always going to be true. It's always going to reflect the latest values of both of these pieces, the balance and the price. If any of them changes, a new remapping is going to happen. So the Boolean resulting from this will always reflect the latest state of the system. It is in basically simple and very, very elegant. But it is very important to remember that simple and easy are not the same thing. Uh, as I mentioned, there is a learning curve. And most of the basic pieces are very quite simple. But it takes some time to learn how to properly use them. So let's talk about some of these building blocks. So we, we mentioned observable very quickly before. So I kind of want to uh, go over what is the difference between an observable stream and the regular values that we use every day. So let's take an integer and an observable of generic type int. So when uh, working with integers, pardon. So when working with integers, we really have independent values. They are not related to each other in any way. Each of these values is just a static piece of information uh, in time, and it doesn't know anything about the past or anything about the future. And an observable of int uh, represents values over the axis of time. So you have these values, and they happen over time. And the fact that they change let you do uh, specific actions based on these changes. So that's the main difference when you compare regular values to a stream of these values. And it lets you do a lot of very powerful things. So a bit about the life cycle of the observable stream. Uh, that's a very important piece of information to know. But it means that there are three events that an observable can emit. Uh, it can emit next events, which are similar to the ones you just saw. They just have values. Uh, it can emit any number of these events infinitely, as long as it doesn't complete or error. So whenever there is a single error or completed event, the sequence will immediately terminate. That means if I have these three next events, and eventually I also have an error event, that error event will cause the stream to terminate. And there will be no more next events at this point. Uh, even if there are more on the stream, they're not going to be pushed forward. And the same happens with uh, a completed event. Whenever there is a completed event, it's going to cause the sequence to terminate, and no more uh, values are going to push forward. It, this is just a very important piece of information to know, because uh, you will be dealing with streams, and it's important to know when they stop emitting these events and what is their life cycle, much like a view controller's life cycle. 
Um, to understand why this is like so powerful, the fact of observables in stream, it's important to realize a very simple truth. And that is that everything is a stream in your app. Um, every, uh, everything in your app's life, whether it's a button tap or a network request or pieces of data or whatever, they're all happening over time. So it means that everything you do can be modeled as a stream of values instead of singular values. Uh, let's look at a few kind of uh, small examples. So as I mentioned, taps of a, of a button. So you, when you tap a button, that action occurs over time. And you can know whenever these taps happen and react to the changes as they happen over time. Same thing for networking. So even if it's a stream that ends eventually, like networking, you would have some result. Then it completes and terminates. Even that is considered a stream. Even a stream that eventually terminates is a stream, basically. And even something more trivial, like the number of products in a shopping cart. For example, if you have a shopping cart app or a store app, um, every time you would add products to your cart, that number would dynamically change, and you'll be able to react to that number change to present a different UI, for example, or update your, your UI accordingly. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, the point of Observable is really to provide a singular uh, API to unify asynchrony across your app. All of these things that you use on a daily basis, uh, be it networking or delegation or UI events or notification center, they can all be put together under this umbrella of observable streams because they all happen over time. Um, so really they can all be modeled as a stream of events or values over time. So at this point, uh, we do have these values over time and that's all great and good, but how do we actually use these events and what can we do with them? So the act of actually listening on these events and doing something with them is called subscribing. So when you subscribe to a stream, you're going to start getting values off of it. Uh, to get a sense of how that works, let's look at a basic piece of code. That might look a bit intimidating at first, but it's very, very uh, simple. I'm going to go uh, line by line to make sure you understand the entire thing. So this first line simply creates a finite stream of, uh, of events. It only emits four events, and eventually it completes. Um, so it, you have all sorts of these operators, like observable of, that you can create sequences with. I then subscribe to that stream of numbers and provide with an on next closure. And in this closure, I can uh, provide my own actions for every time a value changes. So whenever each of these values are emitted, I'll print got next value. Same thing for any error that would occur in that stream, because as we said, there are next error and completed events. Whenever the stream is complete, I'm going to print that. Whenever it's disposed, I'm going to complete uh, and print that as well. We'll talk a bit about what disposed means in a second. So uh, let's see visually how that looks in our console. So we'll have a print of got next one, then four, then minus 24, and then 400. Eventually, the stream completes, and after that, it is disposed, which is uh, what we expect to happen. But we did like skip one very important line of code in this, and it's this tiny last line, disposed by dispose bag. So this sort of means I have this stream, and then I dispose that stream by a dispose bag. Not entirely sure what that means. So let's try to figure that out. So basically, the dispose bag is an object that you would probably tie to an owner of subscriptions. And what it does, it lets you uh, connect your memory footprint to the owner of it. So if I have a view controller that subscribes to a lot of things, I can put these subscriptions in the bag. And that way, all of the memory consumption that is related, all the resources related to uh, that view controllers are inside that bag. Uh, visually, it might be a bit easier to understand, is if I have this owner and it has a dispose bag in it. And I have this piece of code that subscribes to a stream like we saw earlier. So every time I subscribe, there is some in-memory uh, subscription happening. And I put all of these subscriptions inside the bag. That bag is owned by some owner or view controller for that matter. So whenever the view controller deinits, it's going to call the dispose bag the deinit, which will cause all of these uh, all of these streams, sorry, all of these subscriptions to be deallocated as well, which creates a very tight uh, coupling, a very tight ownership model for the memory. Because it means that the view controller owns the bag, which owns all of the subscription that it needs. So whenever uh, the view controller deallocates, as we said, 
first the uh, observables are gonna um, terminate and dispose, then it's gonna get rid of the dispose back, and only then the view controller will eventually be deallocated. So that's basically how you would use a dispose back and why it's a very powerful tool for memory management in Rx related code. Let's talk a bit about subject. So uh, observables, which we mentioned up until now, are sort of read-only. As you saw, we can subscribe to them, we can read values off of them, that's great. But sometimes you need a type that you can write values into or really put more values onto that stream. Uh, in Rx in general, that type is named an observer. But in Rx and Rx Swift as well, uh, there is a type called subject that's very powerful and useful which is both an observable and observer. And that just means we can read values off it, but we can also write values onto it, which makes it very, very useful. And uh, Rx provides four of these subjects. It provides a published subject, a behavior subject, a replay subject, and an async subject. But we're actually not gonna bother with that last one just because it is uh, not very popular and not very useful. But we are gonna talk about the other three and see what they can be useful for. Um, I, it's easier to just show you how each of them works and explain it. Uh, so let's go with a bit of a visual example. So let's say that uh, I have any of these three subjects here, and I put three values onto the stream, A, B, and C. At some point I subscribe to these values, and after I subscribe, I, put in, I push another value onto the stream. So now let's see how each of these different uh, subjects are gonna act based on that behavior. So for publish subject, as it says above, it doesn't replay elements to new subscribers. That means that when you're subscribing, you only get events that happen in the future of that subject. So we're only gonna get D. For behavior subject, you're always gonna get a replay of the latest element and everything that happens in the future. So that would return C and D. That would emit C and D, excuse me. And the last one, replay subject, works much like a behavior subject, but it lets you uh, define the number of elements you want replayed when you subscribe to that stream. So if I do a buffer size of two, it's gonna replay two elements, and eventually everything that happens after the subscription, which is D in this case. So as I mentioned, uh, subject and observable are mainly, you can easily uh, conceive them as inputs and outputs just for the sake of understanding them. Just because observables, we can only read values from them, but from subjects, we, can, we also can write values into. So in many, many situations and cases, such as view models or any other kind of usage of Rx, you would use subjects as sort of inputs, and observable would be that read-only unit you are subscribing from. Okay, so at this point, uh, we can observe values, and we, can, we know how subjects work, and we know how to put values on them, but, I mean, who really cares? Like, why, why does it matter so much? Why is it that powerful at all? So, to understand, again, why this can be useful for apps, we should talk about declaring behaviors. So, one of the most powerful aspects of Rx in general is to let you compose, manipulate, and transform observables into other observables uh, in a way that lets you define behavior. So, it lets you tie different streams together to define connected behavior. For example, uh, I can take a button tap, a stream of button taps, and transform it into some network request, and then transform that into an array of data models coming back from the request, and eventually drive that or bind that into a table view. And that entire thing is a singular chain. It's just a stream converted to a different stream, to a different stream, to a different stream. In the same way, I can even take two separate streams, like we saw before with the combined latest example of the uh, prices of the product. So I have a username and password, and I can compose them into a different stream saying, are these two fields valid? And then that valid stream, I can use it to do whatever I want. For example, I can use it to set the is enabled state of a UI button, or I can transform it again to a title and update the title of the button, for that matter. So a single stream, again, can also be used to feed different properties and different uh, pieces of other streams in that case. And uh, lastly, uh, also filtering operations, meaning if I have an array of uh, people and I only want to get the most important people, for example, I can just filter into that separate stream of uh, favorite people and drive that into a UI component such as a table view. 
And uh, there are all these arrows in the middle of these streams, right? All these transform, compose, drive. Um, and these, let's kind of pull these out. So all these red arrows really describe actions and transformations happening between our streams. But what are these actions exactly? So in Rx, we call these operators. And uh, let's kind of quickly talk about those. So as you saw, it lets you manipulate the observable stream, lets you do all sorts of actions on streams to turn it into different streams. Uh, most operators uh, work the same between platforms. As we mentioned, it is a platform agnostic concept mostly. Uh, so you can take these operators that you learn and use them the same across uh, um, Java and other languages. Some languages have specific behaviors, but mostly it's the same. Um, there is a bit of a mathematical aspect that's added here, mainly uh, the concept that you are combining things and transforming them and mani manipulating them adds that mathematical aspect to it. Most of them are uh, easily chainable. So uh, an operator just takes an uh, observable, returns a new one, so you can chain them together to make a long chain of, uh, a long observable chain. Uh, many additional operators and helper operators exist within the community, and you can easily make your own because, as I said, they just take a stream and return a different stream, so it's very easy to make your own helper ones. So uh, there are many, many operators, more than we'll be going over on this talk, but they are mainly divided into these six groups, which are operators that create, transform, filter, and combine uh, streams into different streams. There are also utilities and error handling, which are more uh, specific, and we're not going to actually dive into that today. Um, let's see our uh, first practical example. So for example, I have this uh, contact app. And uh, whenever I type anything, it goes to the back end and uh, returns whatever names and contacts I have. Um, and uh, yeah, it just filters based on whatever I type into the search bar. And eventually, when I remove everything, it's going to go back to the full list. So um, let's uh, build that, uh, that logic together. Uh, even though it seems like a relatively straightforward screen, we do have a bit of an acceptance criteria, a list of criteria that we want to maintain here. So let's go over that. So we want to throttle text input. That means that if the user types A, B, C, D, we don't want to shoot four network requests. We actually want to wait for that last letter before we go to the network to save on resources. We want to make sure we avoid, du avoid duplicates. And that means that if the user types ABC, deletes a letter, and then writes C again, we don't want to send two network requests for ABC. We only want to send the latest one. We want to get some JSON from the back end. Uh, we want to retry if the request fails. If there are any previous requests that are ongoing, we want to cancel them. We only want the latest request. We don't want to be wasting resources. Eventually, when we get the response back, we'll map that to some JSON model. We want to make sure we clear up memory when we are leaving the screen, of course. And most of all, we kind of want to make sure we can read that code eventually later when we can understand uh, in a concise manner what it does, where it is, and how it works. Uh, you, I think you can imagine the amount of code involved in doing something like that. Uh, it looks simple, but you're going to have all sorts of delegates. You need to build custom throttling logic, custom retry logic, um, duplicate logic, etc. And it's just going to be a really gigantic, painful, hard to maintain piece of code. And let's just not do that. Uh, let's get rid of that. And uh, yeah, let, let's shut that down. And instead, what we really want to do we want to make things more readable and easier to understand and concise. So let's say we build this entire piece of logic in 10 lines of code. I think that's readable. That, that's a short amount of code that I can read later and understand. So um, let's, let's see how that piece of code looks. So we start with a stream of uh, searchbar.rx text. And that means everything that is typed into the search bar, I will get through that stream, and I can just perform actions based on that. Or empty, it just transforms uh, optional string to a regular string. To, uh, un uh, it unwraps the string in that case. Throttle, uh, we ask it to wait 0.3 seconds before passing uh, the last value forward in the stream. 
distinct until change means if there are any changes, we only want the distinct value until there is a change. For example, if I write ABC and delete a letter and then type it again, I will only get ABC once. I wouldn't get the same value more than once uh, until it changes, of course. Now I, uh, I use this flat map latest thing to uh, go to the API uh, and get the results based on what the user typed in and retry it up to three times. That means two times, uh, sorry, the initial attempt and two more attempts on top, on top of it, so three attempts solo. Eventually when I come back from the network, I'm gonna map that uh, response to some array of people. I observe on, so this is a piece I'm not gonna go much into today, but in general, it just means that we wanna accept, uh, like receive those streams, that stream, the values on the main thread because we are dealing with UI that's pretty, uh, pretty important to deal with. And eventually we just bind that into the table view uh, and we set the cells text label text into the person's name at a specific row. And of course, we're gonna dispose by dispose bag. And those are just simply 10 lines of code. I mean that, um, again, you don't have to understand what each piece, piece, sorry, each piece does yet, but you can kind of read most of it as pretty plain English. You have that search bar's text, you throttle it, you wait for the distinct until it's changed. The only thing, flatmap playlist is kind of the only method that doesn't read like proper English, but you can just think about it as something that takes one stream and turns, turns it into a different one. In this case, it takes a stream of strings and gives you back a stream of a network request. Uh, you map that network result to a person model, you wait for it on the main thread, and eventually you just bind it to your UI component. And the first time I saw the, like this piece of code and the opportunities in Kaida unwraps and how much you can get done uh, in such a small uh, footprint, it just, it just blew my mind. I, I really enjoyed it and uh, I thought that that's kind of what made me dive deeper into it and see what more I can achieve with it. Let's uh, get back to work here. Um, so we did talk about operators, we mentioned the term, but we didn't really say what they are. And the interesting thing is that all of these are operators. So the throttle and the distinct till change we mentioned earlier, these are all operators that are bundled with Rx, Rx Swift, and most other implementations of Rx and you can use them on any stream, which is very powerful. For example, if you have some long-running video processing uh, job and it fails, you can just stick a retry on it. It's just gonna retry it again without having any custom logic around that, just something you get for free when you use Rx. So these are the most uh, common operators that you would use on your day-to-day uh, -day life. Um, covering these uh, one by one would be out of scope here, but really recommend checking out the documentation on top. I'll send the uh, slides later, of course. And uh, yeah, the, the documentation is really good. Also the official one is pretty uh, helpful in understanding how those work. Okay, so I know about observables and subjects. I know how to read stuff and write stuff. And uh, I know how to use operators. But how is any of this related to iOS app development? At this point, we talked a lot about streams and streams of data, and we talked quite a lot about the theory of how streams works, but how is it related to us as iOS and Cocoa developers? And that's where Rx Coco comes into play, which we mentioned a bit earlier in this talk. So we kind of talked up until now about Rx Swift, which is the platform agnostic implementation of ReactiveX Rx. So that means that m most of the stuff that lives in Rx Swift I are things that are cross-platform, that they look the same uh, for Java and Swift and Kotlin, etc. But on the other side, we have our apps, the UI aspect of our apps, our iOS and watchOS and tvOS apps, and we are missing this piece in the middle to connect them. And that piece is exactly Rx Coco, which is another, it is the glue that sort of connects the streams of the platform agnostic concepts to our uh, UI components. So uh, Rx Coco provides two uh, traits. So that word traits just means uh, an observable that has a special uh, addition to it. So uh, an observable with specific traits, as you would say. Uh, it represents properties and events on these UI elements and an observer, which as we said, goes the other way, meaning you can write values into it 
called a binder, lets you bind streams to your elements. Uh, for a more visual uh, example, control event describes uh, events that happen on UI elements. For example, a tap on a button, or a change event, or a did scroll in a UI scroll view. A control property describes properties of these UI elements. For example, like the Rx text we used earlier, that's a control property. Uh, UI sliders value or UI switches on state. And a binder, which again, as we mentioned, goes the other way, meaning binding streams into UI components. So you can bind your streams into alpha or is enabled or is hidden of any UI view. Let's see a bit of examples of how that looks. So Arctoco provides most of the basics uh, reactive extensions that you would use in your uh, regular UI kit uh, and, uh, and app kit, et cetera. So simply add .rx after most of your UI elements and you'll see all the options you have. For example, if you do button.rx, you might see the tap option there. Or take textview.rx did begin editing will let you observe whenever that uh, con control event is happening. Same for control property. Uh, text with rx text, which we used earlier in our example, or a date picker's rx date, lets you really listen to any change that occurs and lets you uh, perform specific actions based on these changes. And a binder, which as I mentioned, goes the other way. So it lets you bind streams into the is enabled state or the title is hidden or really anything that it comes bundled with rx coco and you can easily make your own of these as well. So let's uh, have one, another small example to connect all these pieces of RxCoco. So we'll build a small screen that has three very, very simplistic rules. Whenever that text field here is empty, the button will be disabled. Whenever it's full, the button is enabled. And whenever I press that button, I'm gonna change the label on the bottom to say, hey there, and whatever is on the top of that uh, UI text field. So. This is where defining behaviors comes into play, which we mentioned earlier. So defining behaviors, we have uh, three different behaviors here. Um, so first of all, we have a behavior between uh, the text field and the button, and that means the behavior is whenever that text field changes, it, it changes the enabled status of the button. So if this is full, it needs to be enabled, and if it's empty, it needs to be disabled. And then the second one here is that we have a more co uh, combined kind of uh, behavior. When you tap the button, we need to get the last of this, this stream, the text field text, and we need to make that uh, be applied to the UI label on the bottom. So it's more of a combined uh, kind of uh, defined behavior. Let's see how we write each of, these in, uh, each of these two behaviors in code. So for that first, uh, for, for the enabled state of the button, uh, again, I'm taking the, the text stream of the uh, UI text field here. I'm mapping it to whether that text is empty or not, but I'm flipping that because if the text is not empty, I want the button to be enabled. Then I simply subscribe to that stream that it's now Boolean event, not strings, because it was mapped. And I set the button's uh, is enabled state to that value that comes from the stream. And of course, don't forget to dispose it by the dispose bag. Um, then I just do it for the second behavior there. As we said, it's more of a combined behavior. We're gonna use another interesting operator called with latest from, uh, which will let us return uh, the latest uh, value emitted from the text field, which will be shy in this case. I can then map that to a different string that says, hey there, comma, whatever comes back from that previous stream, and then do the same subscription game, just set the, tech, the labels text to the text that was mapped from the previous stream. Um, so now this would work just fine. Um, it's pretty readable, uh, but there are two specific pieces that I really dislike here, and it's these uh, subscribe blocks, because they're very imperative. It forces you to actually um, have a subscribe block where you call self and bind it, uh, and sorry, and call the text field uh, manually instead of something that lets you just connect things in a more unbreakable way. Um, so let's remove that piece. There is a better way that we can use here, and that's called bind. So this really lets us bind the stream directly to a different observer in this case. So we directly bind the Boolean state here directly to the is enabled state of the button. And here on the second example, we bind the string directly to the UI text field, RxText, which gives us a very concise connection and behavior defined between 
those two different streams and pieces. So this example is really cool because there is no reasonable way you can break this logic. There is no bug that can easily be introduced here because the map always binds directly. There is no intermediate behavior that happens. Same like the UI table view example we saw earlier. There is no real way that you can break that binding because it's a, a direct binding between the two different pieces. We can even just get rid of, um, of the button in general and then it would cause everything that we tap in the UI text field to be directly mapped into the label, which even more uh, explicitly shows how reactive it is, right? Everything we type in the text field will be immediately reflected in that UI label below. And we can even go further and just get rid of the map altogether, and then just whatever I write uh, in the text field will immediately be reflected in the UI label. So a few extra things about Coco, extra Coco that we're not going to really dive into, but I'll just mention two of them, uh, which are, I'll mention three of them. So driver is a very, uh, like we mentioned before, a trait, which again, trait just means an observable, like a regular one, but has special abilities. So a driver just guarantees that it delivers values on the main scheduler, meaning always on the main thread, and that it replays values, like the subject we showed earlier, it replays the last value. Uh, it, and it never uh, emits any errors. So it's really, really good for driving UI elements because UI elements can't get any errors, of course. Um, custom binder, like we saw earlier, like the binders for the enabled state of the button, if you have your own UI component, you can easily make uh, your own binder. It's like three or four lines of code, very, very straightforward, and you can make your own UI component reactive as well. Um, and Relay, just really briefly, Relay is the same as the subject that we saw earlier. That is an input that takes in values, uh, but it cannot error and it cannot uh, complete. It just relays next event. So it's really useful for view model inputs or stuff like that. Um, so definitely a lot of material, but I hope that at this point, uh, the examples I showed you uh, will make you think that it's really cool and that there are a lot of really useful things you can do with it. Um, so th the name of this talk is to debunk the myth of hard. So I do want to talk about two really big myths that I hear constantly when, uh, when working with Rx or really when helping people get started on Rx or, or on our uh, Slack channel. So there are really two main big myths. And the first one is that it is an all or nothing game. So if your entire app doesn't use reactive streams or Rx, you just can't use Rx, and that's entirely wrong. You can start very, very small in a tiny component where reactive streams are really, really helpful, or real-time activity is re uh, really helpful, or just a screen or your entire app. And you can even create very thin wrappers around your existing network layer or existing UI components in a way that lets you kind of use both Rx and non Rx code until you are ready to fully uh, migrate. So really, it's not an all or nothing game for sure. And uh, the, second, uh, the second thing that I hear is that it is insanely hard. <laughs> and that usually boils down to three things. Um, the learning curve is very, very high. So I'm not going to lie, that's very true. I mean, as I said, this lecture was really about pushing a lot of the basics into your head so that the next time you uh, bump into that online, you'll be like, oh, yeah, he talked about this, and I remember kind of what he meant. Uh, so it's really about getting you started. But really, once you understand the concept of streams and how to connect them together and how to think in a reactive way, it's very, very hard to go back through imperative programming. The second myth is that debugging is very hard. So that's also kind of true because of how abstracted and how many layers of abstraction uh, happen on Rx code. Using uh, breakpoints will be pretty useless, uh, but there is a debug operator that's very, very useful here. So wherever you put that debug operator on your stream, it's just going to print out that uh, whatever is going through that stream to your console. So it lets you very easily follow uh, any piece of data that's going through that point. For example, uh, if you have uh, a button that triggers some network request, um, and for some reason you see that network request firing twice, and you're not sure why, you can just put a debug right before that uh, network request and be like, oh, there are two emissions causing this to happen twice. And then you can very easily debug and find uh, the source of that. And the last thing is, huh, that was funny. Sorry about that. Keynote is, uh, yeah. Okay, so <laughs> the last thing was that, uh, 
The last thing about that memory management is hard, but the keynote the animation doesn't let me uh, show it to you. But uh, the, if you just use a dispose bag and make sure everything is, uh, yeah, I don't think it uh, would easily work, but yeah. No, it won't work. It won't work that easily. Anyways, unfortunately, that slide is going to... Oh, yay! Anyways, uh, yes. So, I know. Did you try turning it off and then on again? Yeah. Uh, anyway, so for memory management, really the thing is, as long as you use a dispose bag and properly kind of tie the subscriptions to their owners, you're going to have relatively few amount of memory issues to deal with because the dispose bag is just going to take care of disposing everything as soon as you don't need it anymore. Okay, so um, off to some next steps. That was a lot of material. I know some of you are confused, but great job following so far. Uh, I hope you will get some of this uh, moving forward and uh, take some of this with you whenever the next time you try Rx. So I do want to leave you with some uh, more points and resources that you can keep reading on uh, after you go home today. So I want to talk about third-party libraries. Um, the Arc Swift uh, open source community is thriving. A lot of very, very cool open source uh, projects are going on there. Even if it's wrappers around uh, projects that you currently use and you want to use the reactive counterparts of them, or even completely different concepts that are specific to the reactive community, there are a lot of really, really cool projects going on there. Uh, for example, if you're using Alamo Fire, you can pretty much find any library that you use on your daily basis by just prepending Rx to it, and it, it probably exists. So for example, Alamo Fire, you have Rx Alamo Fire. For Moya, you have Rx Moya. Starscream for uh, WebSockets you have as well. And there are many, many more, and more are being built uh, really every day at this point. Um, there is an organization on GitHub called Rx Swift Community that kind of houses all of these projects, and that's where most of that, this work gets done. And some really recommended libraries that you should uh, check out there um, is uh, some of these on this list, but there are many, many more. Just a few that I'll note. Arc Swift X is very cool. It just provides additional operators, like the one we mentioned uh, earlier. A lot of things that uh, people reuse a lot the, on their daily basis, but are not part of core Rx. So that lets you do a bit uh, extra uh, abilities here. Uh, Arcs data sources is very useful for uh, binding streams into table views and collection views. It does custom diffing that makes sure that only uh, the specific pieces of information changed in your stream are reflected in the table view. So it kind of does a lot of that hard work for you and you don't need to deal with diffing and deciding which cells to refresh manually. Um, and if some of you are interested in more of a Redux style architecture, uh, which is really uh, I mean, which really makes sense in a way, because Rx, like streams in general, reactivity and Redux make sense together. Um, then the last two frameworks in that list, Rx Feedback and Reactor Kit, are very much worthwhile to look at. So let's say you get started and you get stuck and you have questions. Uh, don't be dissuaded. Everything's fine. You're going to get through this. Uh, you can just join our Slack. Uh, we'd love to help you out. There are a lot of very uh, nice people there. Some of them are in this room. Just feel free to join slack.rxwift.org and uh, we'll try our best to assist you. And uh, of course, if you want to learn uh, a few more things uh, about Rx where you can continue your studying journey, there are a couple of pieces of information here that could be useful. Uh, the official Rx Swift and ReactiveX documentations are really, really good. Um, they contain most of the basic things that you need to get started with Rx. Um, the third link is probably the best resource in this list. It's a book by Ray Wenderlich. Uh, I'm totally objective, even though I'm part of the team. I bought a copy way before I joined there. Um, it's just, to, as of today, it's the only book that goes top to bottom how to start with Rx and how to get started with it, and really how you can go from zero to almost a master at that point. So that's really recommended read. Uh, Rx Marbles is a cool iOS app on the App Store that's also open source. Uh, it lets you choose operators and then make fake streams that you can actually practically play with on screen. Uh, and then you can really easily and interactively learn how streams work because you can just play with elements and see how the operators affect them. And lastly, uh, two really recommended blogs by uh, Maureen Todorov, who's also one of the authors of the Rx Swift book, and uh, Adam Borek that also uh, does a lot of interesting uh, content around Rx as well. All of these are uh, really, really recommended reading. So uh, I showed you all of these resources, and I kind of 
said that the book is the best resource here and it's the only one that costs money and that's not fair. So I thought we'll give you a little treat and uh, we'll be raffling two copies of this book right here. I got two of them. So just uh, feel free to go to this link, bit.ly slash rx uh, free book. Type in your email and name and right after the questions I'll be uh, raffling two of the copies here. And that is it. Thank you so, so much. Is it turning off? Ah, oh, yeah, okay. So thank you very much. Um, questions? Uh, I'll start on the front. Uh. Hi, great talk. So I'm an old school reactive Cocoa user. And I think that transform into Reactive Swift. Mm -hmm. What's kind of the the state today? Rx Swift versus Reactive Swift. Yeah, sh uh, you mean uh, Rx Swift versus Reactive Swift and Reactive Cocoa? Sure. So uh, both of them uh, really let you do similar things, and Rx Swift is uh, an implementation of the ReactiveX standard that is dictated by the ReactiveX organization, while Reactive Swift went a different path and said we will make Reactive Swift for iOS specifically, and we will steer out of that uh, standard. And that could be good or bad. I really like the things that they do. Yeah, makes sense. So uh, I really like the, the work that they do, and it's very, very good. But I like Rx Swift specifically because that knowledge is transferable. And when I work on Swift and Java and Confluent code bases, I can easily transfer how streams work. And I can even use the same streams for both of my apps, meaning if I have the same screen, have the same logic, I can pretty much use the same stream. It would look exactly the same. And I can easily communicate with my team members about that. Well, with Reactive Swift, that knowledge is contained within the Cocoa world. Um, yeah, that's my opinion on it. So, I don't know how to ask this correctly. People that that like Rx Swift seem to use it everywhere. Mm -hmm. In in cases like, not not shooting your first example, but your first example where you can purchase something could easily have been done with a computed property. Mm -hmm. And we know when a button is pressed, and we know when people are typing into text fields, how do we keep it straight in our mind when we should actually use it, and when we're using it just because we're in that groove and we're using it for everything? Yeah, totally got it. That's a great question. So um, I think like any other tool, you need to make a wise decision on when it's uh, it's the right choice. For That was a pretty trivial example. But for example, if all of a sudden taxes change, or you add another product to your cart, or you added a bunch of different things, then it would be much easier to combine all of these streams together to make one, uh, one, let's say, one es essential change out of that. Instead of having a computed property, which in that case we need to have a computed uh, property for every piece of uh, information you change, instead of having this sort of unified way of dealing with changes. Um, so I think on when to choose would be uh, just when you have a lot of changing data that you wanna uh, find a good way to hone in a way and, uh, and, yeah, and, and how to uh, transform that different piece of information to singular piece of information that make proper changes to your UI when you want to keep your UI constantly updated. I don't think it fits uh, every app, but I think it fits most situations because as I said, most, of, most apps are uh, event-based and value-based and time-based, so. Okay, we, we go for two questions and then we are. Is there any performance impact on using that? And are there any common pitfalls you have to keep in mind? Mm -hmm. uh, awesome question. Um, so performance impacts. Uh, I would say basically negligible. Um, every framework has a performance impact. This specific, ArcSwitch specifically has a performance benchmark uh, target inside the project that always makes sure it is to a certain standard of speed and doesn't affect performance in a reasonable way. So I think that is actually something that we are, as a team, very, very conscious about. And the Arc Swift uh, uh, Kunusla, which works on that project, is very, very uh, uh, careful of. So definitely no problem. What was the second part of the question? Sorry. Uh, oh, yeah, common pitfalls. So as I mentioned, memory management is one thing. So if you don't use dispose bags and don't uh, kind of contain your streams in a good way, or when you... Um, if your stream emits an error and you didn't notice and then that terminates the stream and don't get more value. So really using uh, a, a dispose bag to manage the memory and use a debug operator to see what's going on in your stream are the two uh, big tips here. 
Uh, is it easy to get into a situation where you could start creating circular streams that sort of start feeding each other? If, for example, you know, a text uh, changes state of a button, but the, the button ex changes state of the text and just goes round and round and round. Yes. How do you protect mm -hmm. against that? So you can easily get into that situation, but uh, really it is very recommended to go for a unidirectional data flow kind of thing where you have only one piece of information that causes the reflection on all of your UI. So that uh, a few streams, for example, that reflect how your UI should look, that you could call it a view state or a view model, or whatever people uh, like to call it. But the changes to this specific stream would drive the UI. And the UI would just push that their inputs into that view model, for example, and that would cause the streams to change. So it's just a one-way thing. And the UI components themselves don't cause any mutation on the streams in that case.